Good morning, everyone. Could I ask you all to take your seats, please? Yes. Thank you all. You're all, you're all. you are all caffeinated. This is our second session of the morning. It's the prime slot for having you all focused and concentrated. So uh, please take your seats, and we will begin in just a moment. Um, would you please join me in welcoming to the stage our no less than five fantastic uh, panelists. Can I start, please, with uh, Jessica Berlin, a visiting fellow at the German Marshall Fund. Uh, Marco Mickelson is the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee of Estonia's Parliament. Uh, James Apatharai is Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Emerging Security Challenges at NATO. Uh, Constanze Stelzenmuller is a fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. And last but not least, Boris Ruger is, of course, Vice Chairman of the Munich Security Conference. Um, right, we've... we've got the title of this panel as Zeitenwende, a turning point for European defence. And it won't have escaped your notice that we have, our panel has a very Germanic flavour to it. Uh, but I'm, I'm adamant that we don't spend one and a half hours um, just griping about Germany, which would be incredibly easy for us to do at a conference like this. We will address Germany, we will tackle those issues, but I hope we also reflect on the fact that this is a Zeitenwende in many more ways than one, uh, both for Germany, for Europe uh, more broadly. I was at the NATO summit in Madrid a few months ago and it was clearly a, an enormous overhaul of the way that Europe defends itself. And of course, we're discussing all of these issues at a critical week. The biggest annexation of territory in Europe since the Second World War, the first violent attacks on a pipeline, presumably by a state actor, uh, um, for, the, for, the, for the very first time. Uh, and as I said to someone yesterday, I don't think it was the Belgians who blew up Nord Stream 1 and 2. Um, and of course, uh, in addition to that, an escalation of nuclear threats and political flux in Europe with the uh, elections in countries like Italy and others looming on the horizon. So without further ado, um, Boris, I'm going to start with you. In the spring, you wrote an essay for the Lennart Merry Conference, a very thoughtful essay outlining six criteria by which we could judge the then nascent Zeitenwende. It's been several months since then. Uh, a lot of stuff has happened. Give us your verdict in three minutes. Nice and easy task. Thanks very much, Shashank. It's a pleasure to be here in uh, Helsinki. And First of all, congratulations to our friends and colleagues here in, in Finland for putting together this first uh, Helsinki Security Forum. Um, two years ago, almost to the day, um, uh, Munich Security Conference put out a report that was called Zeitenwende, coincidentally. And um, it was an attempt to inform and energize the German debate about foreign and security policy one year ahead of our general elections. And I want to read you one short quote, which is, um, Germany's commitment falls short not only of the expectations of its most important partners, but also of the requirements arising from the strategic environment. That was sort of the starting point. Um, we also said, by the way, Russia has challenged the fundamentals of the European security order. All attempts in recent years to enter into a constructive dialogue with Moscow have failed. Full stop. So, starting point. That was October 2020. Obviously, 27th of February of this year, uh, Chancellor Olaf Scholz um, gave a statement in the Bundestag um, and, of course, used um, Zeitenwende as the, the central term. It was a hugely important speech, I think. Um, it was a major course correction. And on the part of the Chancellor, I think it was a remarkable act of leadership as well. Um, if some of you may have read up about about um, uh, you know, the way the speech came about. Um, but uh, Scholz definitely seized the moment and decided that we needed, we needed to change course. Um, massive increase in defense spending, 100 billion euros, delivery of weapons to Ukraine, and so on. So indeed, seven months on, where do we stand? 
the six criteria that I, I um, mentioned in my, my article for Leonard Mary conference, I think are still useful. And I'll just list them. The first one was cash. That's 100 billion. <laughs> The second one I called hardware, um, which was about how do we spend that money? Uh, what, what items um, uh, do we spend on? And also, what is our presence on the eastern flank? The third one was Ukraine. What do we do to back up Ukraine in this life and death situation? The fourth was mindset. Mindset as in German mindset on strategic issues. The fifth was trust building. Trust building uh, first and foremost with partners in Central and Eastern Europe um, who felt that Germany um, had gotten so many things wrong. And the final point was decision making, the decision making set up in Germany for, for foreign and security policy, which I think has been, has been very problematic. And I think if you review these things, it's a mixed picture. So on the cash, I would say, um, and Johann Wadefuhl of the CDU CSU group is here and he can talk about that as well. The Bundestag um, did take the decisions and that included a decision to change, to amend the basic law, um, which required obviously a two thirds majority. So um, in a sense, you can say that that was done. Um, on the hardware, we know that um, this money is being spent on defense. There was a debate on whether it might be spent on diplomacy and development and God knows, but it is being spent on defense only and in part because the conservative opposition insisted that it be so. The picture on support for Ukraine is mixed. I'm sure we'll hear a lot about that from the room and from the panel. Um, mindset in Germany, I would say um, also mixed. I think it's a long, long road, long and, and hard road that is ahead of us. But I think we started to, to um, adjust our mindset. Trust building uh, with Central and Eastern European partners, very much needed, I would say. I think there's a lot of unhappiness about Germany and perhaps France as well. Um, and a lot of question marks. And finally, decision making. We are in the process of producing a national security strategy. And in that context, I see some movement in terms of revamping the setup for um, decision making in Berlin. So I think there's some progress there. But overall, a mixed balance sheet. Boris, thank you very much, and, and, and thank you for packing all of that. So it's, it's such a concise uh, space. Um, uh, Jessica, can I move on to you? You've just come back from Kiev not long ago, uh, and, and one of Boris's criterion was that level of support to Ukraine, that question of, of arms. Um, it's a sort of hugely you know, divisive subject now. It's a source of great bitterness in some of these debates. Mm -hmm. Give us your sense of how you grade Germany and, and what's next? What, what, what can we build on um, rather than just complaining about this? Do you see any opportunities here? Yeah, we're, we face, uh, as always, in a great crisis, some opportunities, but um, a few things. Firstly, yes, Germany has uh, slaughtered many holy cows in what used to be German security policy dogma. So that's a good thing. That's progress. But the bad news is the Zeitenwende, as it now exists, is it's an idea. It's a slogan. But my concern is that the current leadership in Germany, um, and this, this cuts across parties. This isn't a partisan statement. We have a severe lack of strategic capacity at this level. We have the same people in power um, to an extent who actually helped create the crisis we are now in. And I don't see the people who created the problem also being the people who will solve the problem. There's a great need for transparency um, this is one of the things you know, I'm hearing a lot from our Ukrainian partners um, in Kyiv, as well as from across CEE and the Baltics. There has been so much corruption and so much incompetence in the last 20 years of Germany's Russlandpolitik, our Russia policy and engagement. And we need to shake out that rug. We need to know where the money has gone, where it's come from, and who knew what when. And without these steps to counter the corruption, to bring transparency and accountability to the mistakes we've made that have cost both our national security and thousands of Ukrainian lives um, indirectly. Um, there will be no, no real trust anymore in, in the German security establishment. So uh, this is a critical duty for, for basically the next generation, I think, of, of German foreign policy leaders. And that's even almost sounds like an oxymoron. German foreign policy leaders. Uh, this is something that, that our country is deeply uncomfortable with, of course, for myriad reasons, but we no longer have the luxury of our 
another fun German word, Selbstbeschäftigung, our being obsessed with our own affairs and uh, consumed with our own selves. We no longer have the luxury of this. Um, we're the largest country in Europe, we're, uh, we're the largest economy in Europe, I should say, and we have uh, a responsibility to fulfill. Um, lastly, I'll simply make the point also on the Zeitenwende, and, and I say this as someone who was quite excited, you know, watching that speech on a Sunday morning in Berlin, thinking, oh my God, this is coming from Scholz, amazing. But what we've seen in the seven months since is obviously a lot more words than action. And when we talk about the budget, yes, 100 billion euros, that's a lot of money, but it's still short of the 2% hurdle <coughs> um, that we're supposed to be reaching. And to, to paraphrase the Beatles, um, I don't care too much for money. Money can't buy me brains, all right? If this money is not being used wisely, if we don't have strategic thinking backing up these budgets, then, then this will be just uh, very, very well-financed further German foreign policy disasters, and we can't afford that. Thank you, Jessica, for cheering us all up so, uh, so delightfully. Um, Constanza, uh, I'd like to go to you. Uh, I'm going to pretend you're not a German. You're an honorary American for the purposes of this panel. You're based in Washington, D.C. You're a keen observer of American foreign policy debates. Uh, and I would like you to reflect on what this looks like from Biden land and indeed from, from Washington. Um, not just the German angle, really. With, with the sense of, of broader European transformation, of EU-NATO ties, of European defense spending, do they think this is real? Do they they think something is afoot in our, our perceptions of European security changing, or are they disappointed? Are they sort of looking at our contributions to Ukraine and thinking, uh, we've provided all the heavy arms, we saved Kiev, uh, and, and they're sort of broadly, you know, sort of doling out pennies here and there. What, what's the view? All right. Well, thank you very much. First off, also congratulations from me on this first security conference. It's good to be in Helsinki, and it's good to see a lot of friends, many of whom I've seen for the first time after the beginning of the pandemic. So I'm um, glad you're all still alive and working. <laughs> That's not nothing, uh, particularly given the current circumstances. Um, and yeah, um, I, I moved to Washington in 2014 at the height, what was then thought to be the, the Ukraine crisis. And if I got, shall we say, $100 for every time in Washington, somebody uh, asked me, so Constance, the Zeitenwender, is it real? Um, I would have my entire department funded at this point. Um, there is uh, an intense interest. And I mean, it's only, I, I think it's important to point out that after four years of Trump and a particular Trumpian animus, not just against Europe, but against Germany and Angela Merkel in particular, um, a lot of people in Berlin breathed a sigh of relief when the, uh, at, at the election of the Biden administration, which, as we all remember, took a little bit longer than normal uh, than uh, in, in the last election. Um, perhaps you also recall that Joe Biden uh, expended personal capital when he, against a significant bipartisan movement in Congress, decided not to sanction Nord Stream 2. Um, and this was recompensed at the time um, by, by Olaf Scholz with a sort of somewhat tight-lipped smile and the insurance that we were spending a lot of money on Ukraine. Um, the point that I'm trying to make here is that the Biden administration genuinely leaned in on the Germans, um, and the Germans were leaning backwards a little bit initially. Um, I think that that really changed with February 24th and the course of the war. Um, there is now, I think, an understanding in Berlin of just how important this American support for Germany has been. Um, and that I think without that embrace of Germany by the by administration, uh, distrust in Germany would be even higher. And, and I think that is um, something we ought to be grateful for. That said, I think it's also notable that the Biden administration's um, red lines are eerily similar to Olaf Scholz's red lines. There is, a, I, thought, I think, a personal instinct of caution, of fear of escalation, um, and intent to signal to the Russians that there are certain things that we won't do, both on the sides of the likes of Jake Sullivan, 
um, Secretary Blinken, um, Secretary Austin, and, and, the, and the Chancery. There is a, a fair amount of overlap there. Um, but on the whole, I think there is, uh, this is an extraordinary moment in which at precisely the time when we needed it, an American, an, an, an American administration is demonstrating not just an understanding that this war against Ukraine is also a war against Europe and a war against the West, um, and a willingness to put real support and real leadership towards the defense of Europe. That was not obvious at the beginning of the Biden administration, but particularly the, the, the submarine deal, the botched submarine deal with the French, then the botched ev evacuation of Afghanistan, I think could have signaled that things were going to go absolutely the other way. And it was fascinating to watch, if you were in Washington, just how carefully orchestrated from about late October, November onwards, um, American-European conversations were about support, about sanctions, and just how noiselessly the cogs of coordination between Washington and key European capitals um, met and started working together. It was really quite extraordinary. And I, have, I don't think I've seen that in my working lifetime. And again, it's something that, that all Europeans have caused to be grateful, um, but the Germans especially. I think the thing to, to see from, from, from Germany now um, is just how great our stakes are in what is about to happen in America, which is the midterm elections, and the second half of the Biden term. Given what I've just sketched out, this unusually supportive, um, comprehensive, and respectful support of Europe, um, I think we have an existential stake, not in obviously supporting the Biden administration, helping it win the midterms, that's not something we can do. But what we can do is validate their trust. What we can do is validate the investment, the advance of trust that they've made in us um, by the way in which we invest in our own defense and deterrence and the way in which we support Ukraine. Um, let me add one final point. After a, four years of Trump in which the, the Trump administration and Trump himself treated European allies and especially Germany as freeloaders and as economic um, parasites on American power, this is an American administration that has understood the degree to which the European Union's power assets give America leverage in a conflict that is waged not just with military support for Ukraine, but also, also with economic coercion from the West against Russia. In that conflict, European power assets are not just boutique add-ons, as they would be perhaps in a, in a military conflict, but essential elements of the power that we're leveraging against Russia. This is an administration that understands in some the, the degree to which um, America is economically interdependent with Europe. That, of course, is only the case, or that, that power is only real, as long as we as Europeans in the EU and as nation states are cohesive, as long as our own positions are coherent. And we've seen in the French elections, in the Swedish elections, and in the Italian elections, the risks, the real political risks of that coherence. And that is, I think, something that we ought, ought to be concerned about, uh, but the Germans in particular, because that is something that also weakens our position. Thank you, uh, Constanza. So success uh, seized from the jaws of AUKUS um, and evidenced in, in the, the, the early months of this crisis. Marco, can I go to you? The, the, the uh, merging wisdom about this crisis and, and Russia's invasion and all of the attendant changes is that it means the center of gravity of Europe, of NATO, has moved east. 
and that voices in the Baltic states in, in Central and Eastern Europe are more prominent, are more respected, are more listened to than they have been in the past uh, for various reasons, to do with the geography of the threats and to do with the sense that uh, these countries called the Russian threat correctly in many ways. Um, does it feel like that from where you're sitting? Uh, yes and no. Uh, we, we still have pretty mixed uh, feelings. And uh, when we talk here about Zeitenwend and about the kind of wakening up in certain capitals in, in Europe, we don't see yet that this is substantial change. Uh, uh, I think we, at the same time, we have sort of positive news, extremely positive news, but also we have to be uh, very uh, vigilant and to, to, to say that there are still very many deficiencies. Uh, on positive side, obviously, uh, in Germany and Zeitenwende, this is huge change. I hope that they are going to uh, change their uh, mantra about uh, oil tanker uh, to be a, a motor boat, uh, and Germany can be a motor boat in terms of changing their uh, policy, because we need uh, that they should uh, wrap up their sort of not only a declaration, a decla de declarative side, but also uh, in real terms, uh, um, providing uh, what is needed from uh, from Germany, both in uh, in the help of uh, Ukraine, but but also uh, recognizing the total bankruptcy of uh, Ostpolitik and uh, many other um, uh, policies, uh, which led us in many ways to what we uh, earlier in the earlier debate talked about uh, Nord Stream and so on and so forth. Uh, but also here in Helsinki, this is uh, enormous, actually. Uh, years ago, it was unimaginable that we can sit here and talk about security on Helsinki Security Forum. This is huge site for Finland, for uh, uh, Nordic countries. And, uh, and this is first time ever in history, actually, Nordic Baltic area is in a very same uh, uh, security uh, environment uh, very soon, now after Turkey and Hungary will do their job. Uh, or, or also uh, defense budgets uh, going up here and there, and, and actually partly, again, more perhaps in East and Central Europe, if you think Estonia's uh, defense budget next year will be 2.8%, and actually there is a political agreement that for years to come we will have it on a level of 3%. Uh, Poland next year, uh, from next, next year on, 4.3% uh, of uh, GDP. But that will bring what kind of change uh, in terms of uh, dynamics, as you uh, referred to, uh, within Europe. But there are uh, several deficiencies, uh, what we see. Uh, and this is why we have these mixed uh, feelings. Uh, are we really heard yet? Uh, we are awake, but we are commonly very sleepy. We, we, we don't understand yet the magnitude of catastrophe, what, what, is, what, is, what is still there, and actually which is uh, threatening all of us. It's um, even yesterday's news was taken, to my, to my understanding, extremely softly by, by us. Uh, this is something what the last time happened in Europe in 1938. Uh, but still we are, uh, you know, thinking that, uh, oh, Putin uh, has done mistakes and he's not able to, uh, you know, go on and, uh, and, and he's losing. Uh, we should never underestimate them. And, and, and then if we look what we can do, are we really helping Ukraine at the level we need to help at the moment? I, I must argue no. Part of Zeitenwend is the question of leopards and martyrs. Uh, and it, this is perhaps not only the German issue, but also the, the issue of a countries who possess those capabilities. Are we agree, uh, uh, able to agree that uh, we need to supply Ukraine what they really need, and uh, right now, and in massive terms? Uh, in order to help them to uh, enlarge the success what we, they had uh, or still have in, uh, on, on the fronts in East and, and South. Last news coming in from Luman areas tell us that actually the counteroffensive is very well going on and uh, we have to add up uh, there. And, and also um, the question about very 
good, good question, what Terry actually asked uh, during last panel. What should be our uh, clear message to Ukrainians after very yesterday's decision about NATO? Uh, I don't think that this is good to say it's not right time to talk about that. It, it, this is extremely right time to talk about that. This is ex exactly what kind of message should be delivered to Moscow today, that we are very serious uh, to uh, consider uh, Ukraine's membership, full membership in NATO, as soon as it is possible. And we already start to uh, prepare those necessary steps uh, to, uh, to, uh, to make it possible. We already promised in 2008 uh, at Bucharest. We don't need to do it twice, but we need to do it at the moment to show that uh, to Putin as well, he has lost Ukraine forever. Okay, so the vision you're outlining is of a sort of soporphoric Europe that is still waking up from its, its sort of uh, dreams. Um, James, we've just had the NATO, well not, we've recently had the NATO summit. It had a lot of major announcements. Um, I want to ask you about one aspect of that, which is there's a lot of focus on uh, heavy capabilities, on weapons. Um, you, you also spend a lot of time thinking about emerging security challenges. And the question I have is, I have seen many NATO communiques and documents and papers and think pieces over the years that say, we're taking cyber seriously, we're taking AI seriously, we're taking technology seriously. Is this different? Can you, can you prove to us, can you show us tangibly <laughs> that this time is different? How would you convince us that this is something that really is a turning point for NATO uh, in, in that sense, in terms of uh, uh, meeting all of those ambitions and those lofty aspirations? So th thanks for the question and thanks for the invitation to be here. And uh, I, I really appreciate the question put into the NATO context because, of course, A, I don't really want to talk specifically about one ally, but also because NATO also has gone through a real shift in the last few months. Uh, you know, people like to quote uh, Sun Tzu or Clausewitz, but I always like to quote um, uh, Mike Tyson, who said, uh, everyone's got a plan till they get punched in the face. Uh, and. So now we have a new plan uh, after uh, recent events. And, and you mentioned the Madrid summit. Let me just take 30 seconds because I think it's important also to mention the heavy metal before I get to the techno. Uh, hundreds of billions of more, of more euros and dollars are going into defense. The NATO response force is being expanded basically up to 300,000 high, 300, high readiness forces. We're moving from three to six battle groups, expanding them to brigade. By the way, Germany is uh, leading one of those. So it's also taking steps within NATO that would have been difficult to imagine just a few uh, months ago. Uh, we will have uh, more pre-positioned equipment, more forward deployed air defense, stronger command and control, new plans. There's really a lot going on on the traditional side. And that's all being implemented, frankly, with an eye towards, uh, I think, completion by, by next year. So uh, I think that's, that's something good. But you're absolutely right to focus on emerging security challenges. And let me just use Ukraine uh, as sort of the inspiration for us, because it is the inspiration for us to be a little bit more active, actually substantially more active in these areas. So look at cyber. I, I think until recently, uh, cyber has been seen as a sort of another thing you have to look at, a different domain. Uh, like air, land, and sea, let's work on this. But what Russia's attack on Ukraine and Ukraine's response to it has shown us that cyber underpins everything. The fact that Ukrainian uh, communications work means that average people know what to do, where to go, and can communicate with their loved ones. It means essential government services are functioning so that the, where Ukraine has control, it can actually provide services. It means President Zelensky is on the air, motivating his people, but also motivating us to provide the weapons they're fighting with. It's under everything. So we have to make sure that our cyber systems work and are robust. So what are we doing in NATO? We took decisions recently, I mean, the Allies took decisions recently, that we need to substantially enhance what we're doing. So we're working now on uh, basically strengthening what NATO is going to do in three areas. One is better rapid response. Uh, second is better overall standards. And we're going to have a conference, a meeting of uh, leaders <coughs> soon to set benchmarks uh, for cybersecurity for all allies. Uh, and, uh, and third, we need to be able to sort of detect better what's happening with us. Fourth, I would add, we need a much stronger relationship with industry. Industry has been crucial 
in keeping Ukraine on its feet. And so we need to integrate them more into our system. So that's all happening. Hopefully to set up some kind of a cyber hub with permanent presence of industry. So that's one thing. Then second, energy security. Uh, what is quite clear now to all of us is we're going to have to do three things at the same time, and they're macro things with which risk creating fissures within the alliance. One is we are now purchasing a lot more equipment. We're going to forward deploy it, and we're going to use it more at the very least, and hopefully only for substantially more exercising. So an increased demand for energy. Second track is we have to get off Russian oil and gas. And that decision has been taken, but our militaries depend on it just like our societies do. So it's a huge transition. And then the third track, which is also taking place, is all of our governments need to meet their climate commitments that they have taken in the Paris context. And the militaries have to be part of that. So we have to make sure that we make an energy transition by design. Because if we don't do it, the countries that feel most at risk are going to be less concerned about one or the other tracks. The ones that are farther away are going to be focused more on this. And we need to ensure that the energy supplies are there so that we ensure military effectiveness. That is primordial in all of this. So that's the second thing we're looking at. And we're doing an energy transition, thinking it through by design with the military uh, in NATO. Then third is, is new technologies. And look at how creative Ukraine has been in using new technologies to defend itself, using uh, artificial intelligence and big data to identify individual Russian soldiers who are committing war crimes for, for future prosecution, using uh, advanced language processing to listen to what they're doing and know where they're going, uh, using 3D printing for making dumb bombs into smart bombs. Uh, or my personal favorite, uh, using basically apps to be able to coordinate artillery strikes. So instead of it going all the way up the chain and then all the way down the chain to find someone who can uh, provide artillery for a requested strike, it's a little bit like Tinder. I need a strike. Who can swipe right? Whoever's close swipes right. Boom, the strike comes. It's four minutes instead of 30. These are all kinds of innovations because Ukraine is a very technologically advanced country. It's innovative and people are trusted at the lowest level. And that is part of the training that Western countries provided to them. A non-hierarchical, trusting system which Ukraine has maximized with its own skills. So what are we doing about that? We have new strategies out on artificial intelligence, including principles of responsible use. You can find those on the website. Now on autonomy, and we're going to work through six or seven more technologies to ensure that our forces have them and we know how to use them and how to get them. We set up a transatlantic DARPA, we call it Diana, to access the uh, dual use technologies from startups. So we're going to put them through accelerator sites and test centers. We have about 70 of those across the Alliance. It's funded, it's established. And, and I'll stop with this, almost stop with this, we have a one, we just set up a 1 billion euro in innovation fund to invest in deep tech, to invest in the startups that go through this transatlantic DARPA. So we want to innovate and out-innovate China and Russia. Final point I would make, mention is just a little anecdote. Uh, I was uh, with uh, Secretary General Rasmussen years ago when I was spokesman and he was Secretary General. And we went uh, to the Kremlin uh, and uh, sat at that very long table, but at the short sides of it. Uh, and uh, President Putin came in, sat down, looked at Rasmussen and said, his first sentence was, I want to make NATO disappear. And I, of course, had not written any lines for the Secretary General for that opening, uh, but Rasmussen, without hesitating, said, well, that's too bad because I'm going to make NATO stronger. Interestingly, it's President Putin who seems to have made uh, NATO much stronger uh, after all these years. Thank you. He, he remains a master strategist. Uh, <laughs> so uh, thank you, James, for zooming us out and connecting Ukraine with those bigger changes afoot. I'm going to throw it open in just a minute, but first I want to quickly reflect on two things. Um, two things that didn't come up very much, or indeed I think at all. If we had this conversation two years ago, either here or at another one of our uh, the security forums at which we meet each other in cycles several times a year, um, I think what would have been discussed in questions around turning points for Europe would have been the phrase that the Prime Minister raised last night, which was strategic autonomy. 
uh, and, and she, she raised the phrase uh, approvingly, I noticed last night again. Uh, and that raises all sorts of questions of definition, of tensions within Europe over its meaning, uh, particularly ten east-west tensions over its meaning, uh, questions around EU-NATO relations and uh, questions of, of EU aspirations in defense. All of these uh, are, are you know, sometimes quite divisive questions that this has somewhat, have somewhat been buried for the time being. And I find that interesting. That's just a reflection. Uh, uh, and, 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 and if any of you want to reflect on that in a moment, you could. The second aspect is, uh, I was struck yesterday listening to the Deputy Secretary General, uh, James, uh, on his list of threats. Russia uh, is the most immediate threat, he said, reflecting the language agreed in, in the Madrid summit. And then he said, but there are other challenges. And he gave this list that would have seemed remarkable to anyone listening five years ago. I think he said terrorism, instability, and China. Uh, and I think it's incredible that a, a you know, senior NATO official tri it trips off the tongue to put China in a list of three, including terrorism. You know, it's sort of just a bad thing, full stop. Uh, uh, and that reflects transformations taking place in all of our countries, in, in mine, across in other parts of Europe, uh, and, and in, in, in the United States, in North America as well. Uh, and I find it again interesting that amid this turning point, we didn't discuss very much China, but actually it is part of Europe's turning point. Our approach to China is fundamentally transforming. And it does affect these discussions, even if we're currently very, very focused on the immediacy of Ukraine. Um, uh, what I'm going to do is take questions in groups of... Uh, Constanza, did you want to say something briefly? Well, I, I wanted to respond to that. Yes, point go ahead. About strategic economy. Um, look, I think there are three external drivers um, for Europe to work on its own defense capabilities. I think at this point, most of us have agreed, and I think to some degree, even the French have agreed, that full strategic autonomy is, is simply an unrealistic goal, and that we need to interpret it in the sense of a capability to act more on our own behalf and on our own, on our own steam. But we also, I think, have all understood, and this war has proven it to us, is that without American support, uh, we would have been in a much more dangerous position. Now, the problem is, again, we're, we're nearing American midterms in which a key question or a, a, a question that plays an, a fairly substantial role is what should America's role with the uh, relationship with the world be? And if you listen closely, as I have had, to um, American grand strategy thinking, um, the, the positions on Europe are fairly stark. Some Americans consider us subjects of strategy, others consider us objects of strategy. Some consider us useful allies, others consider us not really useful allies, um, but country that should fall in line in the case of a future conflict with China. Um, it seems to me that, that that was why I was trying to make the point earlier that our stakes in this election are very great. Mm. Um, the other external driver, I think, for us to become more capable is indeed China, which has made it very clear that Europe is part of a global dominant strategy. And the difference between Russia and China in their attitudes to Europe is that Putin's take on Russia, on Europe, is a disruptive one. Putin needs a defective, dysfunctional, um, disunited Europe to validate his own, his, his own power system in, in, in Russia. The Chinese need a Europe that, uh, parts of which at least are functioning, the infrastructure space, the physical and the digital infrastructure and the single market. Those are essential to Chinese purposes in a way that they are not to Russian strategic purposes. That's, that I think is an important difference and the reason why the, the Chinese are currently worried about what, what Putin is doing. Um, and finally, um, we, on, on, the, on the Chinese point, certainly, the, what, what I'm seeing in Germany, I'm sure some of you are seeing that as well, is that while the Germans have basically priced in decoupling from Russia, we've, we've stopped importing Russian, Russian coal, we're going to be stopped, uh, stopping um, Russian oil imports by the end of the year, and the Russians have cut off our gas, which we were going to cut off by the end of 2024. So that's, that's done. And Russian-German business relationships were already extremely bad, if we're honest with, with each other, um, 10 years ago. But decoupling from China is another issue. And that, that is the, the, the point where, where our, our strategic autonomy or our, our capability to act autonomously will really be tested. Um, Marco, briefly? Yeah, briefly. Uh, then you asked about uh, 
the topics years ago and now, uh, I think uh, we must realize that uh, to the very latest we were all sleepwalkers. And, uh, and this is what, uh, what you have usually if you sleep, uh, you have dreams, uh, which are mm, very often not very much uh, in connection with reality. Uh, go back to 2008, for instance, James, you, uh, when, when was this meeting with uh, Putin in 2008? Prior to you, Georgia, or after? I think Probably prior. Prior. So what was our reaction after Georgia? Um, reset, uh, hope that this was just some sort of uh, hiccup. Uh, what was the reaction in 2014? For eight years, we uh, Europeans were not ready to accept uh, uh, Ukraine's aspirations to become a member of the European Union. Only after Pucha massacre, we were ready to say, yes, they can be candidate members. And even today, there are some sort of crazy talks about political Europe. Uh, so it uh, tells us that we are, perhaps we are awake at, at the moment, but still very sleepy. And, and the, the reality, what we have uh, hit, is uh, shaking us up right now. We don't have yet this common strategy, what is badly needed. Jessica, I sense the floor is bursting with questions, so you'll be incredibly brief. Um, on strategic autonomy, this war has shown us that it is indeed just uh, a buzzword. We have a strategic dependence on the United States for our security, full stop. And of course, that needs to change, but that is the current reality. Secondly, to your point on uh, the German tanker needing to become a speedboat, a motorboat, that's not going to happen, at least not in this generation. However, I think a more reasonable goal would be to turn it into something like a ferry, a ferry boat that is able to transport useful supplies and personnel on schedule uh, to the target desired. If we can get Germany to, to become more like a ferry than a tanker, I'd be quite pleased. And um, the third point, uh, I think Constanza already pretty much made it, that our decoupling from China will be a much, much bigger headache um, than decoupling from our dependency on Russia. Um, our supply chains, our, not only our exports, but even our production are reliant on Chinese supply chains. So this, um, this is something that we need to start planning for now. Okay, I'm sure someone at Rheinmetall can develop an armored military ferry that would encapsulate <laughs> these, your, your vision of German foreign defense policy. Um, I'm gonna take questions in groups of three, uh, and then I'll go through our panel. We have obviously five panelists, so if, if, if all of them tackle everything, uh, I'll get in one round and then we'll go back to our lunch. So um, what I'll invite the panel to do is pick and choose judiciously and be brief in their answers. Um, but please, yes, I see a hand at the very back. Thanks very much indeed. Um, it, Benjamin Tallis from the German Council on Foreign Relations. When it comes to the Zeitenwender, in Germany's particular expression of that, because we see a more general Zeitenwender as well, but focusing on Germany, I think it's both worse and better that was mentioned on the panel. A lot of the attention has been on the 100 billion special fund for defense, but we know that's barely going to touch the sides. It's not enough to fill Germany's capacity needs. But also the Titan vendor will not succeed or fail on defense. It's a much broader uh, societal transformation that's needed. And so I'm surprised none of the panelists actually drew attention to the 200 billion announced this week for energy price caps or drew attention to the quite uh, innovative moves like introducing nine euro public transport tickets and things like this to try and bring the public along. And that's where I think we can really draw some hope for the Titan vendor is the German public have consistently been ahead of policymakers in terms of their support for Ukraine, their support for Germany standing up and being counted. And I'd be interested to hear from the panel more about how we harness that desire, how we actually bring that desire to change to fruition. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Anyone else? Uh, Edward Hunter Christie, uh, Finnish Institute of International Affairs. Uh, I have just a provocative idea. I'd be curious how the panel reacts. Everybody's talking about the Titan vendor, so Germany's change. But what about Poland's change? So uh, our colleague from Estonia just mentioned, I think you said Poland going up to 4% of GDP. That's an enormous change. We also know Poland is going to increase its force size. So maybe the biggest change in European defense might be Poland. Thank you. OK, and we'll take one more if there's anyone else. Uh, over there, please. Good morning, I'm Jörn Wadefull, 
member of the German Parliament. Um, perhaps uh, two, two questions. The first question is, uh, we talked about what, what happened after 2014. And the one who criticized, especially German, Germany's role and, and the European reaction after that, what was with, with the Minsk process? Wasn't that a, a very good reaction, especially with the, with the German initiative? Of course, uh, with support from France then, and all the sanctions we imposed then on, on Russia. And the second point that, that is uh, linked to, to that, when we imposed these sanctions, and they were prolonged in the last years, we always had Germany, the, Germans, uh, the German uh, government, has always to convince other European countries uh, in, in aligning us, in supporting these sanctions anymore. It was really hard to convince Italy, uh, to convince Austria, sometimes always also uh, France and other countries, that uh, these sanctions are necessary. And now, having, uh, for instance, a new, a new government in Italy, what is, what is about Zeitenwende in Italy? What is about Zeitenwende not only in Poland, but I would like to look to the Western countries, Zeitenwende in Spain. Do you see that there? What is, what is Madrid's, only for instance, position uh, uh, on, on, on the necessary decision, uh, on the necessary turning point for uh, uh, the European policy at all? Thank you. Thank you all for those questions. Uh, Boris, can I start with you? And you can, you can pick and choose at will. Sure. Um, perhaps I'll, I'll, I'll try and respond to what Johann Wadefuhl was, was asking. I was hoping that he would answer the questions rather than adding questions. But yeah. I think um, in, in, in discussions with, with colleagues um, in Central and Eastern Europe, I've sometimes said there's a little bit of Vergangenheitsbewältigung that we Germans need to do with regard to our recent past. Um, Vergangenheitsbewältigung obviously is a big word that looks at dealing with Nazi Germany and, and all that. But in, in terms of our very recent past, what did we get wrong? I think we misread Russia, number one. We had an energy policy that turns out to be a disaster, and we let our defense slip. And so for all the things that we did, that, that were, where we made an honest effort, and, and it's, it's true that the sanctions regime that was imposed against Russia um, cost the German economy and other European economies dearly. Um, true. But, um, but we, we failed on a number of issues, and those, those three issues in particular that I mentioned. Um, we, we signed up in Wales and Warsaw to the 2%, um, but um, we did not have a curve taking us in 2024 up to the 2%. And, and the Chancellor, if I remember correctly, in 2018 said as much. He said, we signed up to 2%, but we're actually going to do one5 um, and, and I think that, that was a failure. Um, we should have, you know, we, we, are, we are supporters of multilateralism. Um, and, and so NATO is a form of multilateralism that, that um, um, or a framework where we should honor the commitments that, that we make and we fail to do so. So I think for everything that we, we did that was correct, um, I think we had some significant failures. Um, James, can I go to you next, please? Sure, and maybe I'll address one issue very quickly and then turn back to China a little bit because I think you raise a really important point. Uh, one is just with, response, with regard to the Minsk process. It was an important process, that's absolutely clear. But I do think, and I just zoom out a little bit, it's not NATO policy, but I think we really need to look at the way in which the Russians uh, engage in these processes. Uh, they are fake. Uh, the, what they do is cause a problem, a huge problem, and then invite themselves or are invited to the peace process. Uh, and then they use proxies, they drag it out, they drag it out forever. It's worth talking to the Georgians and the experience that they have in, uh, in Geneva, I believe it is. And it's been years and years and years. And we talk about a process, but actually it's a fake process. So uh, I would just exhibit some caution about all of these uh, peace talks. Uh, the Russians are extremely good at manipulating us. Uh, in, in that regard. On China, I'd say there's two points that are, are worth mentioning. One is uh, we can talk 
you know, look into the Chinese mind about their hesitation about Putin's latest threats. But in reality, China has politically enabled this invasion of Ukraine. Uh, it was announced, as you remember, right after the Putin-Xi meeting. And because of the No Limits partnership, which they continue to strengthen, uh, the two foreign ministers uh, or, uh, just met and agreed on further measures. Uh, so they're sticking with it. Uh, and they're sticking with it politically. They are absolutely reinforcing uh, disinformation from Russia on a constant basis about what NATO's doing, about what the Russians are doing. So it's not simply that they're standing to the side. Uh, and I think that's something we really need to take into account strategically going forward. And by the way, which reinforces my strong view that having American leadership for Europe and for Canada, if I can just say that as well, is absolutely essential. We need a team captain too because they have two of them, and they're quite powerful in their own ways, and they're increasingly uh, aligned. And James, uh, James, if that's right, if China is, has enabled it, is reinforcing this disinformation, can I just ask you in a, in a sentence, what is NATO doing about it? You're calling it out, you're listing them as a threat, but what are you doing about it? So NATO hasn't listed China as a threat. Uh, as a challenge, uh, a, a, yeah. a, quite a systemic, severe challenge, but yeah. we can pass the language, but, but putting that aside, what are you actually doing to stop them enabling this invasion? So, as NATO, not much, immediately. But what we are doing is looking very carefully at and taking steps towards uh, ensuring that we look at the strategic dependencies or potential strategic dependencies that we could be creating with regard to China as that regards our own security. So, for example, that means Chinese acquisition of critical strategic infrastructure all across Europe. And if you look at a map of where China has controlling interests of ports and airfields and IT infrastructure across Europe, it's not just the port of Piraeus, it's in every country in, NATO, in uh, Europe, uh, or almost, uh, and needs to be looked at extremely carefully. It means not creating new strategic dependencies as we transition away from Russian oil and gas to depend then on green tech, new tech, where China controls all of the minerals, rare earths, processing facilities. So that means reshoring, creating capacity in our country so that we can ensure that we are not dependent on or creating new strategic dependencies on an unreliable supplier. That's a huge challenge, but we have an opportunity now. If we're going to do an energy transition by design, this is part of the design. Don't create new strategic dependencies. And then finally, it means protecting our technology companies from acquisition or the data that they have or their inventions from acquisition. So that's part of our innovation fund and our transatlantic DARPA initiative, this Diana initiative. We are providing alternative, we are providing funding. We're providing uh, access to all 30 NATO markets. We're providing education to them to know how to protect their companies from uh, malign acquisition. Uh, so it's all part of the design. It's innovate and protect. Uh, and of course, China is part of that calculus. Constanza? Well, look, I would like to perhaps play uh, another role here. You asked me to play the American role, but the other um, element that we haven't got on here is um, countries like the UK, except for you, but you're the, in the unfortunate position of being the moderator. Um, I've just come from London, um, where the new trust government has, um, in one fell swoop with its mini-budget, uh, destabilized the pound and the British economy in, in, a, in a historic manner. Um, at the same time, uh, the British government has played an absolutely key role, together with the Americans, um, in its support for Ukraine, in really leaning into this conflict, not just with military support, but, but with intelligence um, support as well. Um, if we are in agreement here, which I think we are, is that we are looking at a future for Europe of permanent external disruption, and an uncertain future for the transatlantic alliance then we also need to figure out, as Europeans, of how to close ranks. I want to return to this problem of cohesion. And we have se several options for doing this. We can formalize relationships, i.e. by the Finns and the Swedes joining the alliance. One thing that wasn't mentioned this morning was that the Danes opted out of their security opt-out in the EU. Really important, must, much less discussed. Um, I think we have to have a discussion about the status of the neutrals. 
we have to have a discussion about Austria, Switzerland, Ireland and others, many of whom have crucial roles to play in a conflict that, that is hybrid and that has an important economic aspect. The Swiss are really core in this. Um, and then that leaves the question of what we do with countries that have left the EU, but that are, that are key members of NATO, um, such as the UK. And I think that is where the, the question, obviously we're not going to see the, 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 the Brits returning to the EU any time in the near future, nor are we going to see the Norwegians do this. But I think the question is, can we use this concept of European political community to come to pragmatic informal arrangements that, as it were, bring them closer in, where we have conversations on, on security that is not just military, which is something we can do in NATO, but also our economic relationships, our societal relationships, particularly as a t at a time in which we are seeing these domestic threats to democracy um, that, that, that have just been mentioned. Thank you, Constanza, for reminding me of the mini-budget. After this talk, I'll be doing a collection, Sorry about of, that. A collection of euros <laughs> to replenish the, uh, the UK's foreign exchange reserves for all of those in the audience. You know, you can come back to the EU any time. Well, that's, that's, I'll pass the message on. Um, <laughs> Jessica, please, go on. Uh, sure. So very briefly on Minsk, I completely agree with James. Russia was not participating in good faith, so Minsk was doomed to fail. Um, and in terms of sanctions, if the sanctions had worked, we wouldn't be in this situation today. And that's all I'll say on that. Um, but to, to Ben's question on civil society and, and public opinion, public mobilization in Germany. Uh, so the good news is it's been incredibly positive. Um, public opinion in Germany has been staunchly pro-Ukraine. Uh, there's you know, monthly polls showing that even just in the last three months, uh, support for Ukraine uh, despite rising energy prices, has increased, actually, from July till September, from 70 to 74 percent. Mm. So it's not just consistent, it's even rising, even in the face of increased energy prices. Um, the bad news is, unfortunately, there, there's a vacuum of political vision, leadership, and communication coming from the government to the German people. Um, we're living in a time of historic uncertainty. Germany and Europe together were going through such, uh, such drastic changes and we would need, and regardless of party, right, we would need a chancellor, a defense minister and a foreign minister who truly bring the German people along, who talk and walk them through what's happening and why, and what we need to do and why. But that would require having a vision having a strategy and being able to then implement that strategy to achieve the vision. Jessica, and that's I what's push missing. back on one of those points, yeah. which is I, I, I heard Anna Baerbock speak at the mm -hmm. uh, uh, forum in, in Kiev a few weeks ago. Exactly. I heard a pretty strong message from her. I mean, I, I heard a message yeah. of a, someone who was speaking pretty plainly and laying out those threats very starkly. Yeah. That speech could have come from a British foreign minister, a Polish foreign minister, in, in my opinion. Am I, am I wrong? Uh, in part. Um, so she did name the threats, and I, I was there as well, um, uh, you know, sitting there in the room. <laughs> and actually what struck me in her comments was it was great to hear, so she names the threat, she does. But then when, when asked about German leadership, she specifically said that Germany didn't want to lead, that Germany would, would work together with our partners. And, and that, for me, um, was just, you know, dodging the buck. Can I just come in on that? Yes. Yeah, please. And, and yeah. that sort of, um, I'd like to go to the question about Poland, right? Um, because what you say is entirely right. Poland um, has stepped up and has played such yeah. an important role. So in my mind, it would, be, it would be quite wrong for Germans to overemphasize their leadership role, right? We, we, we need to do this together. It also goes back to Constanze's point about sticking together. I, I understand that there's a lot of criticism of Germany um, dragging its feet on delivery of main battle tanks, infantry fighting vehicles and these things, and constantly making the point that we should do this together. Fair enough. Um, but sticking together is actually quite important. And, and I, I, I sort of ever so slightly disagree with you, um, Jessica, that, that um, there's sort of a complete lack of vision, that there's zero leadership. 
Go back to the 27th of February, that course correction that Scholz announced was very important. And I've been, I've been a diplomat in the German Foreign Service for 33 years, and I can tell you that it was painful to observe as a diplomat, speaking on behalf of the German government, our endless explanations for why we couldn't do the 2%. It was painful how we avoided um, sort of, you know, addressing the issue of nuclear deterrence and ensuring that we would maintain a capability um, in the form of dual capable aircraft um, to be part of a NATO setup, to be part of a nuclear deterrent setup. And that has changed. So, um, you know, perhaps I'm a modest guy, um, but, but I think there's an, an enormous change that has happened. Now, um, you can ask, is it sufficient to address the crisis on our hands? And is it sufficient to help Ukraine in this life and death struggle? And I think that's a fair question. And I think we should do more. But I would, I would, I would not go as far as you in, in sort of, um, you know, deciding that there's a complete lack of leadership, a vision. Um, I think that's, that's a slight exaggeration. Okay. If I can oh, you want to come back for a yeah, second? So briefly, thank you. So to the point on cohesion and leadership, I completely agree that we need to work together. But the truth is, our partners are looking to us to, at the very least, lead by doing what our size and our wealth demands of us. And that inaction and the fact that we haven't delivered on that is, has, been, uh, has created a vacuum of leadership where the rest of Europe is looking for us to do our duty at the bare minimum. And secondly, in terms of cohesion and trust, the requirement of trust, this comes back again to transparency, to the need to investigate and root out and have accountability on the extreme corruption that has also uh, led to this crisis. And this is perhaps also a moment where Germany would need to lead. We are not alone in this. I mean, the London city, you mentioned Austria, Italy, you know, Switzerland. A lot of us have a lot of dirty laundry with Russia. And this is also a point where Germany, I think, could and should show some leadership and we need to, uh, as we say in German, sweep in front of our door first. This is something that needs to happen Europe-wide. But the fact is, we are the largest economy in Europe, and also, due to our history, we bear a responsibility to get this right. And the lack of articulation of this need, and especially from, from of course, Chancellor Scholz being SPD, and they having, perhaps, um, the worst dirty laundry um, out of the major German parties in this, uh, that lack of leadership, I find quite frankly damning. Okay. Yeah, on uh, two points on uh, Poland and Minsk process, I think that we have entered uh, to the area of multipolarity of center of gravity in uh, center of gravities in uh, in uh, Europe, and the way this is no way back uh, to the uh, sort of uh, situation we we had uh, prior to 24th of February or even prior to. 2014, and this is thanks to first and foremost to brave Ukrainians who have uh, fought their uh, war of independence in a way that uh, we don't have other option today than to realize that uh, we will have completely new set of uh, power in Europe uh, uh, after the war <coughs> is uh, fought to the very uh, victorious end by, by Ukrainians with, uh, with our help. Then on Minsk uh, process, um, and actually last but not least in Poland, I, I think also uh, uh, the uh, NATO enlargement in the Nordic countries, Finland, Sweden, being members of NATO in the future, in, in the near future, will uh, definitely make Northern Europe, Nordic Baltic area, very important power player uh, in, uh, in Europe and uh, in the Western world as well. On Minsk process, uh, there were positive sides and negative sides of that. Positive that this was necessary for Ukrainians uh, to uh, um, stop uh, that time, 2014-15, the war where it was, uh, and to get ready uh, what we have right now. Uh, they didn't have uh, armed forces, uh, what was needed to stop uh, Russian invasion that time. Negative side of uh, Minsk process uh, was that uh, certain uh, uh, capitals in Europe thought that the uh, job is done 
and uh, let's be um, um, modest with Russians, uh, don't escalate, don't talk about European perspective for Ukraine, and don't uh, deliver necessary uh, military uh, aid and help uh, to Ukraine. I, I just, uh, you know, uh, remember last year EU uh, discussed about to send a training mission to Ukraine. Uh, you know, we weren't able to agree upon on that. And this was partly, you know, connected to, to this, that there were misguided hopes that uh, means process can uh, keep a uh, big war away over, uh, from Europe. Okay, thank you, Marco. Uh, back to the <coughs> floor, please. Any, any other questions? Uh, over there. Thank you. Uh, Jakob Hallgren, Director of the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. Thank you for a most exciting and interesting discussion. I'd like to come back to the China uh, discussion and the China point that Trishak uh, raised, uh, China enabling uh, Russia on the political and diplomatic front that's obvious as we have discussed. But it seems as if we see some hesitation when it comes to uh, the sanctions, uh, uh, Trade-wise, I have an, uh, an example that I heard recently of a fairly major Swedish telecom company that left Russia. Huawei did not take the place in the market as a result of that. As far as I know, you might know better, we haven't seen any Chinese weapons deliveries. If that were to be the case, that, that on the two other scores, that, that would, uh, uh, China would change tack on that, that would of course represent an escalation. So. Is there a risk of, 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 of such an escalation from the, from the Chinese side as, as, as you see it, or how would we manage that? And I guess this also has to do with European independencies and what Constanze uh, said about uh, the much bigger uh, significance of a, a decoupling with, uh, with uh, China. So, thanks. Okay, I had a question over there, I think. I must admit that I am somewhat puzzled. <laughs> I did read the speech by the Chancellor made in Prague a few weeks ago, 22 pages. I also read the speech made by the German Foreign Minister soon after that, and the speech by the Minister of, of Defense. And there was one thing that was common in all of them, three speeches, it was mentioning of German leadership in Europe. Yeah. But uh, the Minister of Defense added military leadership in Europe. It was quite an interesting thing because in earlier times we have often heard from Germany that we have to take more responsibility. Instead of using the word responsibility, now the word is leadership and that is no small change. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Charlie? Hi, thank you. So, Charlie Sloan, Spasmanak, Finnish Institute of International Affairs. Nuclear weapons were mentioned, but I'd like to get back to it. Um, partially because soon, hopefully, NATO will have two members whose political establishment, and I'd argue the civil service, have no experience in formulating national, never mind allied nuclear policy or contributing to it. Do you think, as a, as a whole panel, the European political establishment has the knowledge and wherewithal to have this discussion, including with their populations? That's a great question, because I suspect this may be our last round. Are there any others, particularly at the back, uh, who would like to also get in before I go back to the panel? Anyone else? No? We've, we've We've stunned you into silence and answered all your questions other than those. Excellent. Um, perhaps this time I will go this way round. We have 20 minutes left, so um, if we're all you know, relatively modest, we'll, we'll get through everything. Um, <laughs> Jessica, why don't you start us off? Sure. Um, so on the Germany question, the fact that they use the word leadership, um, for me, after seven months of this war and uh, hearing words and then observing the subsequent actions, I'm skeptical, you know, I'll believe it when I see it. Um, leadership means taking proactive action. And that's not what I'm seeing from this government. 
Um, so the fact that they've replaced the word responsibility with the word leadership um, is, is not enough in my mind. And even if, for example, uh, Germany is, is unwilling right now to, to lead on heavy weapons, you know, um, I, I, um, right after Kiev, I was in Washington and, you know, spoke with folks from both parties and the consensus was unanimous. Germany can and should deliver modern battle tanks to Ukraine. We have no problem with that. We would welcome it for various technical reasons. Um, the German tanks would even be better suited than the American ones, etc., etc. So this is something where Germany could actually lead by doing. And then a second piece, um, even if they were unwilling to do that, would be on the econ economic side. Um, as we know, Ukraine is in a budget disaster. They need money, they need uh, guarantees, and so something that the German government could lead on right now would be guaranteeing, making loan guarantees to the Ukrainian government, um, you know, forming a coalition um, within Europe, you know, with the EIB, with the Norwegians, with whomever, to make sure that Ukraine's budget is secure. You know, there, there are myriad things we could be doing that would actually be leadership. And I think until we see such actions, such proactive steps of Germany actually leading the way, um, I, I will take the speeches um, only at lip service. Marco. Yeah, I uh, fully agree uh, what uh, Jessica said about uh, it's always good to have, beside nice words and declarations, also real deeds. Uh, and this is uh, the time to, to, to show if, mm. uh, if your uh, words are really have uh, some meaning. But at the same time, I must say that it feels to me at least that there is a certainly the uh, no return line is, has been crossed uh, in Germany uh, as well. That there is a okay, it's this uh, oil tanker issue again coming up. You know, it will take time, slow, but st still, I think the majority of political. Uh, of parties uh, in, uh, in Germany, they uh, realize that uh, they have to make uh, considerable changes. Uh, but uh, on uh, nuclear issue, uh, I think this is an extremely important question. And uh, I, I don't have a good answer to that, but, uh, but, uh, but we have to deal with this because our communication is certainly is not as good today to our public. Uh, it should be at a time when we really have uh, probably uh, the highest risk uh, since uh, 1962 uh, that we would see uh, nuclear weapons to be used. At least we are living right now in constant uh, threat of, of that. So that uh, demands from uh, NATO and uh, NATO allies as well and for, from nuclear countries uh, to, uh, uh, to communicate uh, not only to Putin uh, behind the closed doors, but also to, to our public, how do we should uh, handle this issue. Thank you. James. Um, so thanks for that. First, on China, I, I think it's really great that we, we came back to it. And I think we need to sort of see how this war is benefiting China, uh, which is part of the reason why there is this no limits partnership approach. Um, First, I think, you know, for example, if the U.S. Congress were to see that Chinese weapons were ending up in this war on the Russian side, there would be a massive reaction and not just there. And the Chinese know this. Um, but just stepping back a little bit, it's been, you know, centuries long Chinese strategy to have two other major powers bleed each other and watch. And this is what's happening. Russia is being weakened. And if you look at the list of benefits to China, they're really long. Russia is being weakened economically and militarily, and is very much more dependent on China now when it comes to markets. The US pivot to Asia is at the very least now complicated, and the US is locking down forces in Europe and political attention in Europe. Also, China is expanding into the political and economic space uh, that has been opened up in Africa and in Latin America. Uh, the benefits go on and on, and as we shift away from Russian oil and gas and towards green tech, we're going to become more dependent on them. Uh, so, uh, without really lifting a finger, uh, not much of a finger, uh, except a political finger, China has benefited and continues to benefit enormously uh, from what's going on here. In fact, if there's one winner out of all of this, it's probably China. Uh, second, on German leadership, and this is obviously thin ice for a NATO official, but I, I do want to say, actually, 
I, I understand all the criticisms, uh, or hear them anyway, when it comes to transferring of weapons. But I think it is worth noting that I think traditionally Germany has been comfortable operating in larger structures, you know, with others. And in NATO, Germany has been actually quite active. And I mentioned expanding, like taking leadership with uh, enhanced forward presence and expanding it. They did that instantly, quickly, and it's very credible. Uh, we looked at the plans. Uh, second, they've opened up this uh, headquarters in Ulm for uh, transatlantic uh, logistics. The point about defense pending, which we already mentioned, uh, they've been quite robust on messaging in ways that we wouldn't have seen a year ago or two years ago, uh, including, for example, on the pipelines. I won't go into the negotiations, but, you know, that's a, a shared, strong statement. So I just want to give credit to Germany, at least within the NATO framework, they clearly have stepped up. Uh, and that's, uh, I think, important to know. Uh, then finally, on, on nuclear weapons. Uh, I think it's a really, really important point, And there's a lot of experts in this room who understand, and I, I can see them here, who understand Russian nuclear doctrine, but also the way in which that doctrine involves communications. So Russians see tactical nuclear weapon employment as being perfectly plausible. They see the employment of nuclear threat quite early on the escalation scale. Uh, they talk about uh, escalating to de-escalate, which is basically a nuclear strike and then you won't attack us anymore. Uh, so they see nuclear weapons totally differently than we do. Their doctrine is different, their communication is different, uh, and it's very important to understand that as we make decisions uh, on uh, nuclear weapons, and that includes obviously communication, but also the way in which we structure our doctrine. So within NATO, of course, we have a very strong framework for that. We have a nuclear planning group that meets at ministerial level, that meets at, at ambassadorial and other levels, which is very much about education and understanding and also putting in place the procedures uh, to, um, to respond to that. And of course, we rely on allies, not just the United States, but allies to share the burdens of, uh, of NATO's nuclear mission. Uh, and that really has to continue. I think that that debate has probably ended now and everybody is willing to, to step up and, and do it. So I think as Sweden and Finland move into NATO, they will also move into this nuclear planning group and this nuclear planning dis and the nuclear planning uh, decision and uh, sorry a uh, discussion. Uh, so I'm pretty comfortable that that discussion can take place. But uh, the communication with publics, I think, is a really really important aspect of this, which has been underdone. Uh, and we're going to have to, unfortunately, have difficult discussions with our publics to educate them about what is coming at us, what not to be worried about, what we should be worried about. Uh, that needs to start. James, can I just follow up on one short point, which mm -hmm. is NATO has uh, non-strategic nuclear weapons, uh, uh, the US has non-strategic weapons mm -hmm. deployed in Europe, Boris mentioned the nuclear sharing arrangements. Um, someone earlier in the last session talked about the NATO-Russia founding act and some of the language in there about the nature of deployments and force, of forces in the East. Can you envisage uh, any expansion of NATO nuclear sharing arrangements? Is that something NATO would be open to if there is appetite from members in the East uh, who feel they haven't been part of these NATO nuclear sharing arrangements. They're part of nuclear planning group and, and allied policy, but they don't host B-61s. They're not part of that nuclear sharing in terms of uh, dual capable aircraft. Is, is this, a, is this a, a, a sort of third rail that a NATO official is not going to touch? Uh, and I'm, I'm making you sweat by asking this, or is it something that you, know, you can envisage actually is evolving and expanding? So I'll say this, and I want to stress this is not NATO policy, just asking someone who's been in the building a long time. First, <laughs> Every day now, decisions are taken that I couldn't have conceived of two years ago. And I mean every day. It's absolutely remarkable. So that's one thing. Second, you, uh, I think someone already mentioned that uh, the NATO-Russia Founding Act, to all intents and purposes, is not being, and that's not considered to be implementable. So that is a function of what Russia has done. So they can now, you know, take, uh, take credit uh, for that. And third, I would say, you know, the strategic environment has changed so fundamentally that nothing is off the table. Is that being discussed now? Not that I'm aware of. But could it be discussed in future? I will no longer rule anything out. I think that's a really clear and, and interesting answer, actually. Um, yeah. Constanza. Very important. Um, on the leadership point, uh, 
you know, you've got three Germans here in this panel, all of whom are on record in writing as having been critical of, of Germany's efforts in the defense and security space. So, um, you know, you're almost forcing us to be contrarian uh, in saying, actually, we are doing shit. So, um, I think it matters if the young 40-something leader of the SPD, Lars Klingbeil, gives a key foreign and security policy speech in Berlin saying, we have to lead. Massively critical of his party's record on, on Russia. I think, give them credit. They're literally, they're trying to change the narrative, and I think they're succeeding. The, 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 uh, this current new legislature in, in Berlin is younger than it has ever been, more diverse than it has, uh, has ever been, and you can see a distinct shift if you talk to younger legislators from, from the narratives on Russia and on German, Germany's role in the world from earlier generations. Give me a break, this is serious. I, I, I think that is very real. Okay. The other th point I'd like to make is that, according to the Uk Ukrainian defense minister himself, our heavy weapons have made a difference in Ukraine's counteroffensive. The Gepards, um, the, um, in, in particular. Um, the other thing is we have, I had to look this up, we've committed 4 billion um, euros in, in aid to Ukraine. Uh, the EU has committed 13 billion uh, to, to Ukraine. We pay a quarter uh, of the EU's budget. I would suggest that's actually quite a lot of money. We also have registered a million Ukrainian refugees. Now it's well known that Ukrainians travel across the border a lot, but still we have, I mean, the, the Poles are still the winners if, if we're having a beauty uh, competition here, but, but Germany has, has actually um, given, given refuge and solace. solace. And, and not just that, it's not just hosting the refugees, it is breaking its own, its, its own rules, allowing them to work, putting children into, into school and so on. All of which, you know, was the right and the necessary thing to do, but this is not us doing nothing. Finally, on, on the nukes, um, again, let me, I think what, what James just said here is, is, was really important, um, and, and I think should be noted by all of us. But again, consider, a, consider a, uh, the eventuality of a renewed climate change in, in America and America's relationship with Europe. That will raise the question, of the role of the French and UK, UK de deterrents in the defense of Europe and the relationship of the rest of Europe with that. You know, that's something that presumably nobody really wants to discuss at NATO right now, but are people thinking about it in Europe? Of course they are. Is that a question that if I were Finnish or Swedish, I would be very, very interested in to see what the, what the French and the Germans and the Brits are thinking about? Absolutely. And finally, on, on the Chinese, um, I have to say, I hope, I mean, it's, it's been, it's obvious that representations have been made by Western leaders to the Russians to say, if you use nuclear weapons, if you even test nuclear weapons, all bets are off the table. Now, that is not to say that we would react with nuclear weapons, but there would be extremely severe conventional reactions from all of us. And I hope that we are also telling the Chinese that it is in their considered self-interest to reinforce this message, because otherwise our relationship with China will change severely for the worse as well. I want to just add a couple of points to your initial remarks on German weapons and note that from our reporting, The Economist, my colleagues in Ukraine, uh, we were told by commanders in, in Kharkiv, in the Kharkiv offensive, yes. that German anti-aircraft guns were very important. Yeah. in facilitating that offensive. And indeed, just before I came, I also read in the German press uh, news of BN, the BND's intelligence uh, assistance exactly. to Ukraine. Very true, albeit, albeit carefully calibrated so as not to be seen as providing battlefield-relevant targeting information to kill Russians, which would be a, 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 a sort of a, a step too far for the BND, clearly. Um, and on, on nuclear weapons, it reinforces my sense that as with strategic autonomy, the question of the role of, for example, French nuclear deterrence to European partners, a subject that was discussed 18 months ago, a couple of years ago, in terms of uh, uh, other European states being invited to participate in French nuclear exercises, for instance, um, that's a dormant discussion. It hasn't gone away. It's under yeah, the surface. Absolutely. It's going to come back. Absolutely. And it's lurking there. And I think that's something that we need to keep our eye on. Um, 
uh, Boris, over to you. Perhaps you can see the clock. We have six minutes left, so yeah. you're very well placed to draw minutes. us to a, a close and, and offer some concluding thoughts no, as well no, for hardly. us. But, but um, let me talk to three points. The first one is, is Germany and leadership. I think when, when um, Olaf Scholz and Christine Lambrecht um, and um, uh, the chairman of the SPD um, speak about leadership, what they're really speaking about is Germany, and I think this is sort of what Jessica said, Germany playing a role that is commensurate to its size in terms of its population and its economy in Europe. I do not think that they believe that Germany should be telling everyone else what to do, mm -hmm. right? So it is, it is a kind of collective leadership, and this is appropriate also, um, because, again, if we look at Poland, if we look at um, the Baltic states and what they have done, and, of course, if we look at the United States of America that has provided more support to Ukraine than all of Europe put together, the European Union and its member states, right? So it would be silly if, we, if Ger the German you know, government were to go out and say, we will now tell everyone what they should do. Not the case. But what they're saying, and rightly so, is we should step up and we should, we should do more um, in terms of being the largest EU member state. Um, I do think we have examples of German leadership, and, and, and James has talked about the enhanced forward presence. So the German government came out and said, we will have a brigade headquarters um, in Lithuania, we will have a brigade um, at the ready, basically, to reinforce, we will exercise this. And we were the first to do so. Um, and that was, I think that was a, a good example um, of leadership. Although the brigade will be committed, but not deployed. In exactly. Form. I think, you know, um, I, I know that the Balts would like to see ideally a division in each of the countries, but I think the reality is it would not be so easy, yeah. um, you know, to have one division in, in each of the Baltic, Baltic countries. But it's a step forward, and, and, and we'll take it from there. Um, second point, on, on China. Obviously, China has been on, on NATO's radar since 2019, at least, when it was mentioned at the NATO leaders' meeting in London. Um, that was the first time I, uh, I believe that China has been in a communique um, at the level of heads of state and government. So they've been on the radar. I, I disagree ever so slightly with James on whether China is benefiting. I think there's, there's a number of benefits. But I think China is also, um, is also losing, to some extent, a partner, right? So um, China was able to rely on a strong Russia that scared all of us in Europe with its military prowess and so on and so on. Turns out Russia is not as strong, not as capable. Um, and and um, we, we shall see how it, how it plays out. But at the end of the day, I think Russia will be a much weaker partner there's benefits in that for China, perhaps, but there's also a significant, um, a significant right. blow to China's global standing. Um, and I think that's what we should, we should focus on. And finally, on the nuclear issues, much has been said, but I think, um, to Charlie's question, um, across NATO, I think, um, there's an understanding that our nuclear IQ is not where it should be. And I think that includes even the United States of America, that we do not have the capacity um, across the government, um, um, uh, right, in, in terms of our um, network of military, diplomatic, intelligence officials um, that we once had. And that is, a, that, that is something that we have to redevelop. Um, because Mr. Putin is telling us that um, this is what it's all about. So we have to relearn some of those skills. And I think as far as Sweden and, and Finland are concerned, these are two countries that have a very serious uh, strategic culture. I think Germany, my country, could learn quite a lot from, from um, nuclear, not nuclear thinking, but strategic thinking in general. Um, and, um, and so I think um, you know, we can learn from you, and I have no doubt that, that very quickly you will fit in and you will be a great asset to this alliance. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I just want to uh, sort of reflect for a second on a couple of other things we, that didn't come up, and perhaps that's also notable. Um, uh, one of them is a question, again, that would have ricocheted across these sort of discussions a, couple, a few years ago. That's the question of uh, arms control, intermediate-range nuclear forces, and the future of those forces in Europe, both in security terms and on arms control terms quite understandably as to why that has dropped off the agenda, but nonetheless uh, something that may just be dormant rather than gone, and that plays into bigger questions of US-Russia arms control that will affect us as Europeans. Um, and uh, indeed in the, in the past we've seen President you know, Macron try and 
articulate a strong European voice in those negotiations. That was part of his diplomacy in January that has now been swept aside. Um, we didn't spend an awful lot of time discussing uh, the transformation of the way we look at the Black Sea region, which is also very, very important. You know, we've, 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 this has had a, a German-focused flavor. We've looked at the view from the Baltic states um, and, and a lot of other things. But actually, you know, one of the big changes from this crisis is, is the intensification of the importance of the Black Sea and Southeast Europe and, and all of the radical changes taking place there, including new uh, uh, NATO missions in, in, in those places. Um, uh, and then, of course, I'm heartened by the fact we did spend a great deal of time not just reflecting on the, the complexities of the German case, and I think we did get a good range of views. Jessica, you're particularly critical and, and identified why you are as well in the structural problems in German politics and the need for transparency, but also, Constanza, your, your, your point is, is, is well heard. That this is, these are you know, his, heroic and historic efforts, and more as the contrast with your time as hmm. uh, a diplomat having to defend some of these things, I think is very, very striking. Uh, and I'm, I'm delighted we did actually spend some time I'm thinking about those bigger issues that transcend this moment, uh, particularly China, its role in Europe, its role after this war and how it comes out, and also the role of uh, big security issues that are, are very timely, but re will require years to address and that is things like nuclear weapons and what you, what you called our nuclear IQ, our ability to grapple with questions of nuclear strategy, deterrence, uh, and those dynamics in Europe, things we haven't thought very hard about for many, many years. So I think in, in reflection on our panel title, uh, we are seeing a Zeitenwender. We've, we've, we've probed the nuances of that in Germany, but I think we're seeing so many other turning points in Europe, we're almost struggling to keep up. And I thank uh, all of our panel for helping us think through these issues.